Welcome back to The Great Adventure, Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology. This is the 12th in a series of on this topic, and we're dealing today with pulmonary function testing part four. We're going to talk about airway obstruction and distribution of ventilation. So this is The Great Adventure, and we're down here with uh, obstruction and distribution of ventilation. So again, we want to approach this with the enthusiasm of a kid in a candy shop. And uh, recall that there are basically two abnormal pulmonary function patterns, restrictive disease, stiff lungs, small lung volumes, and obstructive lung diseases, airway obstruction, increased resistance, um, air, decreased maximal extra flow rates. Let's begin with measuring airway resistance. 80% of airway resistance is in the large airways. And recall that if we look at total cross-sectional area from the trachea to peripheral airways, the smallest total cross-sectional areas here in the large airways. Thus, measures of airway resistance primarily reflect large airway obstruction. Resistance, again, equals change in pressure over flow. So remember, in order to have flow through a tube, you have to have differences in pressure on each end. So we need to be able to measure flow and pressure simultaneously to measure resistance. If no flow, the pressure is equal at both ends of the tube. So for airway resistance, we measure generally mouth pressure minus alveolar pressure because what's in between the mouth and the alveolus is in fact the airway. So we've talked about the pressure walk before. So if we want to measure airway resistance, we're going to measure mouth minus alveolar pressure. All right, so there is a relatively easy method called the flow interrupter method. So um, this involves a situation where we have a pneumatac where we can measure flow and a port where we can measure pressure and a shutter that we can close. Basically, when the shutter is closed, we can measure pressure here. There is no flow, obviously. When the shutter is open, we measure flow, this pressure minus this pressure over a fixed resistance. So what we do in this technique is to have somebody breathe along in and out. Okay, they're generating a mouth pressure, right? And then we close the shutter, which interrupts the flow. So at this point in time, flow instantaneously goes to zero. Now, there is no flow. So the pressure at both ends of the tube, i.e. the mouth to the alveolus, are the same. So this jump quickly gives us alveolar pressure, right? And we had mouth pressure down here. So we now have flow and we have change in pressure so we can calculate airway resistance. It's really a, a nifty, simple, elegant method. And we had previously used this in children down to about four years of age. It's easiest to do this with a body box um, setup because the body box does have uh, a shutter, a pneumatac, and a area for mouth pressure measurement so that one can do this. Remember, we cannot measure um, flow and pressure simultaneously. So the beauty of the interrupter method is it allowed to do this. We can measure air resistance in the body box, and this is frequently done. So in the body box, we can relate changes in flow and pressure to changes in box volume, okay, or box pressure or volume. And this allows us to calculate air resistance. Recall that we can measure FRC um, in the body box by closing the shutter. So now we've got mouth pressure being measured here. We can have somebody pant. We can measure differences in volume and differences in pressure. All right. Remembering Boyle's law that pressure times volume equals a constant. So we basically get, when we take the first derivative of this, we get this equation and we can reconfigure and get volume equals minus pressure, which was barometric pressure, over change in pressure over change in volume, or DPDV. And that gives us this angle. Okay, so we're plotting mouth pressure change versus volume change or box pressure change. All right, and we can calculate the volume of FRC, although we're not going to use that for this particular. Again, a good curve would give us a slope like this. Uh, if the curve looks like this, we take the middle portion, we kind of forget the tails here. This would be one that would be impossible and probably we shouldn't proceed. Now, if we want to measure our resistance, we can do the same thing, okay? So we have someone in a box, changes in box pressure 
or change it in volume. But now we have the, the shutter open, so we're now measuring flow through the pneumatech. Right? So here we've got resistance equals change in pressure over change in flow. Right? The angle of the first um, curve was change in pressure over change in volume. Um, the second curve, this one, was change in flow over change in volume. So now we have change in pressure over change in flow, which is, in fact, resistance. This um, angle here with the box open is change in flow over change in volume, which gives us this equation that we just talked about. And we use the tangents, actually. We can use the tangents in this equation. And again, uh, we want to be sure that we get a good angle. Box, again, is calibrated when empty, so we need to correct for box volume. Since the body is mostly water, we assume density is one kilogram per liter, and we have this correction formula. Core effort, again, is used to leak around the mouth. This will decrease mouth pressure measurement, will result in an artifactually increased FRC and inaccurate airway resistance. Large panting makes both of these inaccurate. So um, as we decrease lung volume, right, we decrease the size of structures or increase the resistance. Uh, conversely, as we increase lung volume, we increase the size of, of airways and decrease resistance. We would like to correct resistance for the lung volume at which it was measured. So Zaplatal and Modiyama again showed that maximum external flow rates are best corrected by total lung capacity. The reciprocal of airway resistance is airway conductance, which is abbreviated G airway. Um, we correct conductance by the volume where it was measured, FRC. And remember, we got that FRC measurement in this um, thing, and that's called specific airway conductance, which is simply airway conductance divided by the FRC was, at which it was measured. So that's really a better measure of airway um, conductance as shown here. 80% of airway resistance is in the large airways. Thus, airway resistance measures large airway function. Airway resistance can be measured by the flow interrupter technique or by the body box, body pressure plethysmography. Let's uh, explore bronchial hyperreactivity. So the caliber of large airways is determined predominantly by bronchial smooth muscle tone. Asthma is characterized by hyperreactivity of bronchial smooth muscle tone or bronchospasm. Provocative tests can bring out airway hyperactivity. Inhaled bronchodilators can cause acute changes in bronchial motor, uh, bronchial muscle tone. When assessing bronchial hyperactivity, there are medicines we want to avoid. We want to avoid in inhaled bronchodilators and anticholinergics prior to performing PFTs. So this applies when giving bronchodilators to improve bronchospasm in subjects with abnormal PFTs. It also applies when using provocative tests to show bronchospasm in subjects with normal PFTs. Inhaled corticosteroids or leukotriene inhibitors need not be withheld. This is the table again. We showed this before of um, medications that should be withheld before PFTs where we want to look at airway hyperactivity and the timing involved. Uh, most commonly, this is going to be the short-acting beta agonist, which need to be withheld four to six hours prior to uh, testing. Some patients with chronic lung disease use airway clearance, including albuterol, every morning. If they come to the lab later that morning, their PFTs will already be post bronchodilator. That is, they will be within that four to six hour uh, window of having taken albuterol. Consequently, they will probably not show response to bronchodilators because their airways are already dilated. If there's baseline airway obstruction, we want to measure bronchial hyperactivity. We give a short acting beta agonist uh, to induce bronchial smooth muscle relaxation. This will increase maximum extract flow rates post bronchodilators in asthma, a normal individual should not show a significant change in airway tone or in airway caliber following a bronchodilator inhalation. 
This is work done by Bruce Nickerson, who was a former fellow here at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, uh, actually when he was a resident at Tucson. And what he measured was within subject variability of pulmonary function testing. And you can see that um, what he did was take some normal individuals, measure PFTs once a, week, a day uh, for five days, and then calculate the mean, in this case, the change. And this is percent change. And you can see that for the most part, uh, pulmonary function tests don't change that much for the same individual um, day to day. Significant changes would be shown here. So we use the PFTs that reflect large airway obstruction and have the lowest variability. And these are generally peak expiratory flow rate and FEV1. The FEV2575 will often show a greater change in individual patients but a greater change is required to be diagnostic because it's not as steady um, a, a pulmonary function test. There's more intrinsic variability. So this would be an example of a mild asthmatic who begins with airway obstruction, takes a bronchodilator, and his flow, um, time volume curve here improves. This is what the flow volume curve might look like. Mild obstruction, takes a bronchodilator by inhalation, and the flow volume curve improves. More severe asthma may not return to normal, but should improve. And likewise, may not return to normal, but should improve post bronchodilator inhalation. Can it be asthma without improved PFTs following short acting bronchodilator uh, beta agonist inhalation? Yes. Short acting beta agonist inhalation improves acutely reversible airway obstruction due to bronchospasm. Inflammation common in asthma, will not show acutely reversible airway obstruction. Treatment of inflammation may improve airway obstruction over time. So if there are normal PFTs prior to inhalation, airways may be fully dilated and may not show further improvement. Okay, so the absence of a change in um, bronchial uh, smooth muscle tone or extra flow rates does not rule out the diagnosis. So um, we include this phrase in interpreting pulmonary function tests. Uh, when talking about a negative response to an inhaled short-acting beta agonist, that it does not rule out the diagnosis of asthma. So we will say, there was no significant change in maximum extraordinary flow rates following inhalation of a short-acting beta agonist bronchodilator, indicating the absence of acute bron bronchial hyperactivity. This does not rule out the diagnosis of asthma. So I think it's an important point to make. If baseline PFTs are normal, all right, short-acting beta agonist bronchodilators may not show improved flow rates, right? The reason is that bronchial smooth muscle is already relaxed, all right? So um, here at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, I see a number of pulmonary function tests where pre and post bronchodilator PFTs were ordered, but the pre bronchodilator pulmonary function test was normal. These airways are already dilated and there rarely is further improvement following the bronchodilator. So if the baseline PFTs are normal, you'd really like to consider giving a provocative test of bronchial hyperactivity. That is something that will induce some bronchospath. And the tests that are available are exercise stress test, cold air challenge, histamine inhalation, and methacholine inhalation. For all patients where provocative test is being used to diagnose bronchospasm, do not proceed with a provocative test if there's significant airway obstruction, i.e. FEV1 less than 50 or 60% predicted. Give a short-acting beta agonist bronchodilator instead. All right. So it potentially is unsafe to give a provocative test if you've already got significant airway obstruction that you might make worse with the test. So the provocative test we're going to use, I'm going to rule out cold air challenge at the moment because this is very difficult to set up. Um, there are devices one can generate. We tried one once. It was very awkward. It required a lot of compressed air, and I don't recommend it. So let's talk first about an exercise stress test. So this is most useful to document exercise symptoms. Strictly speaking, 
the exercise provocative test for bronchial hyperactivity requires exercising at a maximum heart rate of greater than 170 or about 80 percent max for six minutes now first i can tell you that nobody can actually do this nobody can keep their heart rate up that high for six minutes free running or uphill treadmill running provoke exercise induced bronchospasm more than for example bicycle children may have difficulty performing the maximum store flow volume maneuvers after maximum exercise uh, this just shows the fall in peak flow for asthmatics running basically gives you the most treadmill a little bit less bicycle less swimming less and walking considerably less so if you want to you know get the most bang out of your buck here the test you want to do for exercise provocation is running um, and on a treadmill because usually it's difficult to do that in a free running situation run on an inclined treadmill for six minutes aim for 80 percent max heart rate and you measure spirometry 5, 10, and 15 minutes after stopping. And as I mentioned, almost nobody can actually do this in terms of exercising at that level for a full six minutes, but you kind of get the best you can out of it. So this is a normal response. So normally, and we will talk about this when we talk about exercise, normally one of the things you do to reduce work of breathing with exercise, because you're increasing ventilation so much, is have bronchodilatation. You want to decrease airway resistance. So in normal individuals, there's actually an increase in peak flow during exercise. Following exercise, there's not much change in normal individuals. Asthma is characterized by hyperreactivity. So they actually, in some cases, will have more of a bronchodilator response exercise, but then they will have a bronchoconstriction fall following exercise. This might be an example of somebody with exercise induced bronchospasm. So pre-exercise, their flow volume curve looked like this. Following exercise, they had even more obstruction. So their curve looked like this. So that was time volume curve. Um, flow volume curve, their pre-exercise might have looked like this. And again, post-exercise is worse. So the curve might look like that. So this was study done by Myra Katan um, in uh, Toronto at the Hospital for Sick Children. And he studied a number of normal children and asthmatics um, doing this six-minute protocol. And what he found was that the normal change in uh, spirometry, so peak flow, FEV1, FEV25, 75, FEV15, 75, really was not much. Okay. The normal range, however, because there was a difference in standard deviation, um, for peak flow was greater than 10% drop, FEV1 greater than 12.5% drop. In order to be diagnostic, a drop in FEV2575 had to be greater than 26%, and these we don't usually use, but they were fairly high also. These were his results. So the blue represents the mean of the normals, the red bars indicate the normal of those children with chronic, relatively severe asthma. And you can see that as a group, they had much more decrease in pulmonary functions for these parameters than the controls. And if we look at asthmatics who responded, so 83% had a response in peak flow, 84% in FEV1. It was a little bit less in these. But if we ask the question, if you had a fall in peak flow or FEV1, Virtually everybody was abnormal. So in all honesty, you could look at just FEV1 or peak flow and to pick up who has exercise induced asthma. And the reason, of course, is that these reflect large airway obstruction. Bronchoconstriction is a large airway problem. It's where smooth muscle um, constriction occurs. If a sh child shows exercise induced bronchospasm, always give an inhaled bronchodilator to reverse bronchospasm before leaving the lab, all right? This prevents the so-called late asthmatic response, which is due to inflammation and is more difficult to treat. So if you've um, provoked uh, asthma uh, acutely by an excess stress test, all right, and you don't do anything about it, it will get better on its own, but later, you are at high risk for having a late asthmatic response, which, because it's due to inflammation, will not respond abruptly to albuterol. 
So nobody should leave the pulmonary function lab in worse shape than they can than they came in. So always give a short acting beta agonist if you've generated bronchospasm for any reason in any test. So as mentioned normally, bronchodilatation occurs during exercise to reduce airway resistance. Minimal airway obstruction occurs normally following exercise. 75% of people with asthma will have bronchospasm following intense exercise. Running is the type of exercise most likely to provoke exercise-induced bronchospasm, and exercise-induced asthma is asthma. It's not a separate disease. Can it be asthma without decreased pulmonary function following exercise? Yes, it can. Only about 75% of known asthmatics will show exercise-induced bronchospasm after sufficiently vigorous exercise. So exercise does provoke bronchospasm, but it's not in all asthmatics. Inflammation will not show acutely worse airway obstruction following exercise. Chronic treatment of inflammation may improve exercise due to bronchospasm over time. So again, in interpreting pulmonary function tests, an absent bronchospasm response to exercise does not rule out the diagnosis of asthma. And so what we say in our report is there was no significant change in maximum exterior flow rates at 5, 10, and 15 minutes following exercise, indicating the absence of exercise due to bronchospasm. This does not rule out the diagnosis of asthma. Remember, 25% of known asthmatics will not show exercise induced bronchospasm. Okay, what about histamine inhalation? So this test is done. Histamine, of course, uh, provokes uh, bronchospasm in uh, sensitive individuals. The test is done with five slow inspiratory capacity breaths of histamine at increasing concentrations. FEV1 is measured three minutes after each inhalation. If there's a 20% fall in FEV1, less than 20% fall, sorry, go on to the next concentration. Stop when FEV1 falls greater than or equal to 20%. Normal individuals do not have a 20% fall in FEV1, even at the highest concentration. So these are the concentrations that are classically used. And this would be an example of a test. So this is a normal test. This is a person who does not fall, this is percent of baseline, to greater than 20% for all of these concentrations. This would be an abnormal test. And what's uh, recorded here is the so-called PD20, provocative dose 20. So where this line crosses the 80% of baseline FEV1, that's what you report as the PD20. So in ter interpretation results, a 20% fall in FEV1 at any concentration is diagnostic of airway hyperactivity. Normal individuals do not show this. The concentration where FEV falls 20% or provocative dose 20 correlates with severity. That is, the lower the histamine concentration in general, the more severe the um, bronchial hyperactivity in a patient. Most children with asthma reach diagnostic criteria without experiencing symptoms. Um, it's more sensitive than exercise at detecting airway hyperactivity, and it's certainly easier to do a maximum extraordinary flow volume maneuver following histamine inhalation than it is following maximum exercise. Um, here you can see in a study done by Craig Mellis that 74% of children with known asthma had an exercise response, and of the same children, 90% of them had a positive histamine response. So histamine is more sensitive. And if your question is only, does the child have asthma, it's probably better to do histamine, histamine than exercise. OK, again, if a child shows a diagnostic fall in FEV1 in response histamine, always give an inhaled bronchodilator to reverse bronchospasm before leaving the lab. This prevents the late asthmatic response, which is due to inflammation and is more difficult to treat. Can it be asthma without decreased BFTs following histamine? Yes, it can. About 90% of known asthmatics will show bronchospasm after inhaling an increasing concentration of histamines. Uh, histamine does provoke bronchospasm. Inflammation will not show acutely worse airway obstruction, and chronic treatment of inflammation may improve histamine induced bronchospasm over time. Finally, methacholine inhalation. And methacholine really has largely or entirely replaced histamine. So this is done slightly differently. There's relaxed breathing for two minutes of methacholine aerosol at increasing concentrations. FEV1 is measured between a half and a minute and a half after each inhalation. 
that is after each two minutes. If there's less than a 20% fall in FV1, go to the next concentration in five minute intervals and stop when that's FV1 falls 20% or greater. These are the concentrations. Interpretation of results, a 20% fall in FEV1 is diagnostic of airway hyperreactivity. Normal individuals do not show this. The concentration where FEV1 falls 20%, provocative dose 20, correlates with severity. It's more sensitive to detect airway hyperactivity than exercise or histamine. Again, this would be a normal response. There's no fall below 20%. This would be an abnormal response. And again, the PD20 is where this crosses the 20% line. If a child shows a diagnostic fall in FV1 in response to histamine, always give an inhaled bronchodilator to reverse bronchospasm before leaving the lab. This present, prevents the late asthmatic response, which is due to inflammation and is more difficult to treat. Can it be asthma without? Uh, Decreased PFTs following methacholine. Yes, it can. Provocative tests cause acute irreversible airway obstruction due to bronchospasm. Inflammation may not show acute irreversible airway obstruction. Child can still have asthma with negative provocative tests. A negative a provocative test should not be performed in children with severe airway obstruction at baseline. An absent bronchospasm, a response following methacholine, does not rule out the diagnosis of asthma. And we would say there was a 20% drop in FEV1 following inhalation of increasing concentrations of methacholine, indicating the absence of methacholine induced bronchospasm. This does not rule out the diagnosis of asthma. So, true story we had a patient with presumed asthma um, in whom we did a methacholine challenge who showed no response. The PF tech, however, had asthma. And methacholine challenge was dispersed into the room. The PF tech developed wheezing and respiratory distress. So uh, know the health of your PF techs, and maybe those with asthma should not be doing methacholine challenge. The caliber of large airways is determined largely by bronchial smooth muscle tone. Asthma is characterized by hyperactivity of bronchial smooth muscle tone. Provocative tests can bring out airway hyperactivity. Inhaled bronchodilators can cause acute changes in bronchial muscle tone. All right, let's talk about distribution of ventilation. Distribution of ventilation, remember, is caused by either decreased distensibility or airway obstruction. But do we have a measure of this? So of the single breath nitrogen washout curve measures many things, not just distribution of ventilation. So let's just look at this for a second. So the way this test is done, is that one breathes in and out, takes a full total lung capacity breath to uh, open up all um, structures and give a, vol a constant volume history, exhales to residual volume, inhales 100% oxygen, okay? And then exhales kind of slowly and continuously, and we measure oxygen concentration, exhaled on oxygen concentration as they exhale. And the curve looks like this. So initially, there's a so-called phase one of the curve. This is the oxygen that you inhaled that is now filling conducting airways. It rises up to a phase three, which is the alveolar plateau, and then a phase four, which we'll talk about. So phase one and half of phase two is what's called the Fowler method to measure the volume of conducting airways, right? So basically this volume would be the volume of your conducting airways, which remember is where no gas exchange occurs. And so the normal value here is about two mLs per kilogram. So you can actually get an estimate of this using this curve. Phase three of the curve is the so-called alveolar plateau. And this reflects the uniformity of distribution of ventilation, right? So think about this for a second. Let's say for sake of argument that we have a lung where there's uniform distribution of ventilation. So when you start the test, you had 80% nitrogen in your lungs. So you now inspire 100% oxygen, okay? Because the distribution of ventilation is uniform, the same amount of oxygen goes into each side, and therefore the nitrogen concentration is decreased on each side, but it's similarly decreased. Remember the best, best ventilated regions of lung fill first on inspiration, 
one t first and x less two. If there's non-uniform distribution of ventilation, then what's going to happen is more oxygen is going to go here. Less oxygen is going to go here. So the nitrogen concentration here is higher than it is here. But this is the best ventilated areas. So when you exhale, this is going to empty first. And then this higher nitrogen concentration is going to follow. So what does that give you? If you've got a uniform distribution of ventilation, the nitrogen concentration is the same. And this slope will be zero. Right? This would indicate a completely uniform distribution of ventilation. Not found in nature, by the way, but that's what it would indicate. For non-uniform distribution of ventilation, and everybody's lungs have some degree of non-uniform distribution of ventilation. All right, this lower concentration is going to be exhaled first, and as you continue to exhale, you're going to get the more poorly ventilated areas where nitrogen was diluted less, so the nitrogen concentration was increased. So the slope of that line tells you about the uniformity of the distribution of ventilation. A normal value is less than 2.5% nitrogen per liter of exhaled air. You want to measure the slope of phase three. So you want to be sure that you clear dead space. All right. You don't want to be measuring this part. And you don't want to include the closing volume, which we'll talk about a bit later. So you want to be sure that you're getting this part of the curve. So this would be the slope of phase three listed here. Many pulmonary function machines arbitrarily use 750 and 1250 mLs. In adults, this might be fine because probably it's going to clear dead space and it's not going to get back to here. So it'll give you a decent slope. But a child with a vital capacity of 1200 mLs, for example, would have too high a slope because this is artifactual. It's not measuring the slope that we want here. The ideal would be to allow for pulmonary function text to select the boundaries. So what does this measure? This measures the difference between well-ventilated and poorly ventilated areas. So it measures the non-uniformity of the distribution of ventilation. It's not an absolute measure of the adequacy of ventilation. Well-ventilated areas or poorly ventilated areas, if ventilation is distributed uniformly, will not give an abnormal slope of phase three of the single breath nitrogen washout curve. One thing about this test is that it is a sensitive test to detect responsive therapy. So this was a study done by David Duzal, who was a fellow here at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And he measured a number of pulmonary function tests in people with cystic fibrosis admitted for a two-week hospitalization to treat a um, acute pulmonary exacerbation. And he measured change in pulmonary function from pre-hospital to the mid-hospital range, that is after one week, and to discharge after two weeks. And you can see that far and away the most sensitive test to measure change in lung function was the slope of phase three of the nitrogen washout. These spirometric values did improve, but the slope of phase three is the one that improved the most. Right? There is a phase four of this test, which is called the closing volume. And we're going to talk about this in a couple of sessions when we talk about tests of small airway obstruction. So let's just leave that one alone. Now, there's also another test of distribution of ventilation, which is called the multiple breath nitrogen washout. And in this test, it's done like the um, nitrogen washout measurement of FRC. You breathe 100% oxygen, you breathe it in, you wash out your lungs, you collect exhale sample, or uh, the computer calculates it so that you get um, basically um, the amount of, of nitrogen that was in the lung when you started this test. The curve looks something like this. So with each breath, you're decreasing the amount of nitrogen exhaled because you're breathing in oxygen. There is a test, it was a test called the 40 breath nitrogen washout test. And the idea was that the, the fraction of end tidal nitrogen which is what these curves show, at the 40th breath should be less than 1.5%. If it's more than that, then it means that there was a delay or difficulty in washing nitrogen out, usually due to non-uniform distribution of ventilation. So this would be abnormal. Um, it would mean that it would take longer to wash nitrogen out than normal, and usually that's going to be some degree of airway obstruction or something that increases the time constant. 
So poorly ventilated lungs, areas of lung with a long time constant, the lay nitrogen washout, this uh, result is increased by a long time constant and does not primarily reflect the uniformity of distribution of ventilation, but does have something to do with the distribution of ventilation. Um, so you can improve the sensitivity of this test by taking the slope of the log of the end time nitrogen, which is a straight line. So areas with a long time constant will have a lower slope compared to those that uh, empty quickly. There is a relatively recent test called the Lung Clearance Index. And this is a, a test, and uh, Ajay Kasi was a postdoctoral fellow here at Children's Hospital 2014-2017, did a nice study using this test. So the way lo the Lung Clearance Index is performed is, again, it's a multi-breath nitrogen washout, breathing 100% oxygen, OK? And again, we're now going to measure and tidal nitrogen, mixed expired nitrogen, and minute ventilation. Okay, so you inhale 100% oxygen until the end tidal nitrogen is less than 2% or less than 1 40th of the initial inspired nitrogen, fraction of inspired nitrogen. You measure minute ventilation and end tidal to calculate the minute ventilation required to get to that fraction of end tidal nitrogen. Um, less than 2%. Then you measure the fraction of mixed expi expired fraction of nitrogen and minute ventilation to calculate the FRC. So you're calculating the FRC by nitrogen washout method. The LCI is the minute ventilation required to achieve an end tidal fraction of nitrogen of less than 2% divided by the FRC. A higher value indicates areas of ventilation with longer time constants. All right. So here's an example. The advantage of this test is that it can be done in young children in whom you may not be able to do good spirometry. So here, this is done with a face mask. It actually can be sealed with putty so that there's no air leaks. And usually, what we've done at least is to distract these kids with a video or a movie or something they can watch. Will they just sit and quietly breathe? No forced expiratory maneuvers are required. So it requires only tidal breathing. You want to avoid large inspirations or irregular breathing. Face masks for preschool children often see with putty, can distract with a movie, video, etc. And the normal value is in the range of six to eight. So this measures poorly ventilated areas of lung with long time constants, which delay the nitrogen washout. The result is increased by long time constant. It does not primarily reflect the uniformity of distribution of ventilation, but it affects how well ventilation is being performed. So this was a study done by Dr. Kasi, and he measured um, the LCI in preschool children who had either cystic fibrosis, uh, cystic fibrosis screen positive indeterminate diagnosis. These are babies or children with abnormal um, mutations, but not CF disease and controls. And he plotted them here against FEV1. So you can see um, this is Z-score, so this is a perfectly normal FEV1 here. Two standard deviations below, so this is an FEV1 below normal. And you can see there really were no controls that had FEV1s below normal. Okay, so LCI, the abnormal range is here. You can see that there were a number of CF patients that had decreased FEV1 and abnormal um, LCI, but look here, this population, the so-called CF-SPID or CRMS patients, who generally are patients who are thought to be normal. They have no lung function, they're um, no lung function abnormalities, they're asymptomatic, and yet three of these had normal FEV1, but abnormal LCI. So the LCI is more sensitive at picking up lung function abnormalities. What was also done was to look at LCI and compare it with the slope of phase three. And you can see that there is a correlation. When LCIs have normal slope of phase three, also as a group tends to be abnormal. Here, um, he plotted um, LCI in years, CF versus controls here, um, slope of phase three with years, and, and again with the CF, both tend to go up. And in this case, LCI, 
versus slope of phase three. And again, you get a reasonable correlation. Um, here we have again LCI versus FEV1 Z scores. So lower values are more abnormal. Um, uh, FEC Z scores and FEV1 over FEC, and the same for slope of phase three. So again, both of these tests tend to be no, more abnormal as lung function is abnormal. All right. Here, what is plotted is both LCI in the triangles and slope of phase three in the circles um, for groups of patients who had normal FEV1, mild lung disease, moderate lung disease, and severe lung disease. All right. And you can see the upper limit of normal for slope of phase three. Um, you know, these patients tend to be more abnormal in the um, more severe lung disease group. Slope, um, lung clearance index in general tends to be more abnormal, suggesting it might be more sensitive to de detect the presence of early lung disease. And then finally, this curve looks at healthy controls with open circles and CF patients. And what you can see here is that there are CF patients that have abnormal LCI, but normal slope of phase three, all right? So the LCI is abnormal more than slope of phase three. Now, why might this be the case? Well, remember that LCI is really reflecting primarily areas of lung with long time constant. The slope of phase three is primarily reflecting areas with non-uniform distribution of ventilation. And I think we would hypothesize from this result that it takes a bit more severe lung disease to get non-uniform distribution of ventilation than it does simply to have areas of increased time constant. So the slope of phase three measures the uniformity of distribution of ventilation. Uniformly poor ventilation may not be detected. Distribution is not uniform on lungs. Measures of uniformity of distribution are sensitive tests of lung function in general. Slope of phase three, the single breath nitrogen washout curve, multiple breath nitrogen washout, and lung clearance index are the things currently being used. Now, lung clearance index is not currently being used clinically in very many centers. It's mostly being used for research. 80% of airway resistance is in the large airways. Thus, airway resistance measures large airway function. Airway resistance can be measured by a flow interrupter technique or by the body box. The caliber of large airways is determined largely by bronchospinal muscle tone. Asthma is characterized by hyperactivity of bronchospinal muscle tone. Provocative tests can bring out airway hyperactivity. Inhaled bronchodilators can also cause acute changes in bronchial muscle tone. Distribution of, of ventilation is not uniform in lungs. Measures of the uniformity of distribution of ventilation are sensitive tests of lung function. They include the slope of phase three of the single breath nitrogen washout curve, multiple breath nitrogen washout, and lung clearance index. Next time, we'll continue to explore pulmonary function testing, um, and we're going to talk about the diffusing capacity. It's one of my favorite topics, actually. It's a very interesting test. And, and hopefully you'll enjoy learning a bit more about that. My thanks to our producer director, Katie LeWinter, and thank you so much for joining us in the great adventure, pediatric pulmonary physiology.